Okay, here we are with lesson number nine and our last lesson in this unit on mechanics. And today we're talking about the centripetal force. Okay, so we looked at uniform circular motion and we've discovered that the centripetal force is really whatever force is acting to keep something moving in a circle. And so Newton's second law tells us that whenever we experience some net unbalanced force, we must be undergoing an acceleration. And the same is exactly true for uniform circular motion. Whenever a an object is traveling in a circle at a constant speed, it must have a force on it which is perpendicular to its velocity. So instead of writing F net equals MA, we can replace the A with the centripetal acceleration when it's moving in a circle. So F net is equal to MV squared over R. And we could also then write F net equals M 4 pi squared R F squared, or we could write M 4 pi squared R over T squared. And these are the different forms of uniform circular motion depending on, depending on what we have and what we're given in a problem. Sometimes we're given period, sometimes maybe we're given frequency, and we can put all these things together. So um, let's take a look at a few examples. A 0 0.2 gram flea sits at a distance of 5 centimeters from the center of a record, and that record is spinning. If the record rotates at 77 RPM, so rotations per minute, what centripetal force must be provided by friction to cause the flea to maintain its uniform circular motion. So we have this little flea and he's sitting on top of the circle like this. So he's sitting on top of the record and the record's moving around and of course if there was no friction this flea would not stay put. He would slide right off the record and we wouldn't even be talking about this but there is friction. And the friction is what's keeping this little guy in place so that he doesn't slide around. So if we take a free body diagram of the flea at some point on the record, he has a normal force, he has a force of gravity, and he's got this force of friction that's keeping him moving in uniform circular motion, i.e. it's pointed towards the center of the circle. We know his mass. We know the radius, we, like we know where he's sitting, and by the way, we're turning grams and centimeters into kilometers and meters. And we also know his rotations per second, we know his frequency. 77 RPM, if we do a quick conversion into instead of rotations per minute, we have rotations per second, which is hertz, is 1.28 rotations per second. And we can now say, oh, well, what centripetal force is acting to cause this flea to stay in uniform circular motion? Well, the only centripetal force that's acting is friction. And so we've got mv squared over r, which we know because he's in uniform circular motion. We don't have to write ma, we can write mv squared over r. And because we don't even have information about velocity and radius, we can write m4 pi squared r times frequency squared. So like we know what the radius is, but we don't know what the velocity is. And so instead of that, we can just write this in terms of frequency, because we do know the frequency. So in this case, the force of friction is equal to the mass times 4 times pi squared times the radius times the frequency squared. All of these values are known. We plug them in, and we can determine the force of friction acting. 6.5 times 10 to the minus 4 newtons. So not much friction has to act here to keep this little guy in place. But there's example number one. Okay, moving on. Example number two. A 0 0.25 kilogram, so 250 gram mass, hanging from a one meter long string. And the mass is spun in a vertical circle at five meters per second. So we found a constant velocity and we're going to swing it in a circle at this constant velocity. Determine the tension in the string at the top of the circle and at the bottom of the circle. Because as you know, if you do this right now, if you take some string, put a mass on the end of it, the tension actually changes as you go around the circle. 
Um, and you can try this. We do this in class as a demonstration, but you can try this on your own as well. You'll notice that the tension in the bottom and the tension at the top, when the mass is at the bottom and the top, those two tensions are different. So let's take a look. Here's a diagram of the situation. And a free body diagram. At the top, gravity is pointing downwards. And here, the tension is also pointing downwards. So these two forces at this point are going to contribute to the centripetal force. At the bottom, though, tension is pointing upwards towards the center, and gravity is still pointing down. And so at the bottom, only the tension is contributing to the centripetal force. Let's look at the top first. F net is equal to mv squared over r. Tension plus the force of gravity, tension plus mg, is equal to mv squared over r. So this is for the top. And when we sub in m, g, v, and r, and rearrange and solve for tension, we get 3.8 newtons of tension at the top. When we look at the bottom though, F net is now equal to tension, which is up, minus mg, which is down. And that's equal to mv squared over r. So rearranging here, we get a little bit of a different answer. We get that the tension at the bottom is 8.7 newtons. And this is, of course, very true. Because when you're whipping something around in a circle, you'll notice there's more tension that's required at the bottom to keep it moving in a circle than there is at the top. In addition, um, we've talked about cars going around curves. And really, it's just like the flea example, where the only thing that keeps a car going around a curve is that friction. Um, just like in the flea example. But here in Canada, we don't like to rely on friction all the time, especially in the winter. Um, and in most parts of the world, people don't like to rely on friction either, no matter what their climate. Engineers don't trust friction because it can change. They play it safe all the time, and they bank a curve. Okay, so almost all curves, when you go around them, all road, all curved roadways, are banked in a certain way. So that we lessen the amount of friction necessary, and the normal force helps us out. So let's take a look at an example of a banked curve and a race car going along the banked curve. So here's a race car, it's traveling around the curve, and it's going 120 kilometers per hour which is 33.3 .3 meters per second. This race car does not depend on friction at all to keep it on the track. In fact, we'll say that it's a frictionless track. If the turn is banked at an angle of 25 degrees to the horizontal, what is the radius that this racetrack, what is the radius of this racetrack? So, here's our race car. We know that the acceleration is towards the center, towards the center of the circle, and we know that the curve is banked at 25 degrees. We know the speed, so we should be able to calculate, we should be able to calculate the acceleration. A free body diagram, though, yields something very interesting. It shows us the normal, and it shows us the gravitational component um, here. But the normal we can divide up into its x and y components. And because we use similar triangles, or because we, you know, we could use the z pattern, this angle at the top is 25 degrees. Okay, so using this information, we can now resolve our component of the normal force. And we can see part of the normal force balances with gravity, but part of the normal force, this horizontal component of the normal force, provides our centripetal force that we need to go around this curve. So the component of the normal in the x direction, 
is equal to mv squared over r. And fn times the sine of 25, which is what this component is, is equal to mv squared over r. So we need to find the normal from somewhere. We need to find the magnitude of the normal force. Well, we're going to have to look in the y direction then to find this. And we can say, okay, well, here the component, the vertical component of the normal is fn cos 25, and that's equal to mg. And so here our normal force is equal to mg over cos 25, which we can substitute into our first little equation. You'll notice masses cancel, and we've made use of a trig identity. So sine 25 over cos 25 is equal to tan 25. We know g. We need to find r. And once we make the substitutions, 2.4 times 10 to the 2 meters, so about 240 meters is the radius of this curve. Moving on. Um, two other examples. A banked curve is one typical um, type of example in uniform circular motion. Ultra, also, uh, when we put things into a centrifuge in chemistry, we might need to separate one material from another. Um, and if you've basically left something to stand for a very long period of time. Gravity has done the work there, and, and that's what sedimentation is. But sedimentation takes a really long time, especially for some things. So often we'll use a device known as a centrifuge, and that will be used to separate substances that are suspended in the liquid. Um, and we spin things in a circle, and then, of course, we get um, the centripetal force helping us with this sedimentation. Um, satellites are another really, really good example of things that use uniform circular motion. Um, like the force of tension in, in the string and the mass example, Earth's gravitational force can be used to keep things in orbit. Right, So gravity also can sometimes act as a centripetal force. So any satellites that are geosynchronous, basically they stay at the same spot in the sky. They travel under the force of gravity. They stay in uniform circular motion, but they're tens of thousands of kilometers above the center of the Earth, right? So here's an example of, of one of these satellite questions. A certain satellite has a mass of 3,021 kilograms. How high above the equator? So the height above the Earth um, must be maintained in order for this thing to stay in geosynchronous Earth orbit. So I'm going to give you the period of Earth, which also, because it's geosynchronous, is also the period of the satellite. So 23 hours, uh, 56 minutes, and 4 seconds. The Earth has a mass of 5.98 times 10 to the 24, and it has a radius of 6.38 times 10 to the 6. All right. So here's a satellite. It's in uniform circular motion and it's zipping around the Earth. The only force that's acting on this satellite is gravity. And gravity, in this case, is providing what we call the centripetal force. So we know here that this satellite has an, a, an orbit, an orbital radius of Earth, the radius of Earth, plus its height above the Earth. We know its mass, and with a quick little calculation, we know its period in seconds. 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4 seconds turns out to be 86,164 seconds. And we know the mass of the Earth. So, F net equals MA. What's providing a centripetal force is gravity. And if we recall, the force of gravity is G times the mass of the Earth times the mass of the satellite divided by the distance in between them. This is equal to, and again, now we're switching from mv squared over r to our version of this that uses period and radius because we want to be able to use period because we've been given the period. 
So rearranging, I've got gmt squared over 4 pi squared equals r cubed. When I make my substitution for my numbers and I take my cube root, I get that the radius of orbit of this satellite is 4.2 times 10 to the seventh meters. Now this would be the distance of the satellite to the center of the Earth, and we don't want that. We want how high above the Earth, so we need to subtract out we need to subtract out the radius of the Earth. And so when we do this, we get 3.58 times 10 to the 7th meters.